On the 18th of March, 1889, a series of dramatic events occurred here in the East End of London, heart of the area settled by Jewish immigrants from Russia and Poland. A Jewish workers' committee set up to protest against the conditions of labor in the East End clothing industry staged a march to the Great Synagogue on the Jewish Sabbath. The chief rabbi prayed inside, while outside workers demonstrated, calling on him to intervene against the squalid sweatshops in which they toiled. According to the Times newspaper, the Jewish Workers' Committee passed a resolution condemning the indifference of rich Jews. The committee told working Jews not to depend upon the well-to-do, but to organize a strong lobby for the abolition of the entire capitalist ruling class. A riot broke out, and the police made a number of arrests. Similar scenes followed elsewhere. In New York, Thousands of Jewish workers marched beneath red flags and trade union banners through the streets of the Lower East Side. And in Poland and Russia, the original home of these immigrants, Jewish workers and artisans mounted strikes against their employers and made plans to resist the autocratic Tsarist government. It was in these years, between 1880 and 1900, that Jewish socialism was born. Within two decades, it became a force to be reckoned with, both in Jewish life and in the worldwide socialist movement. This was a remarkable phenomenon. Since emerging from the ghetto and progressively achieving equality in the countries of Western Europe, many Jews had become solid members of the middle class, liberal or even radical in their politics perhaps, but by no means revolutionary. Certain Jews had played a part in the formation of socialist theories and the organization of early socialist movements, but they had done so as internationalists, not as Jewish socialists. Moreover, socialism itself often appeared to be prejudiced against Jews and what they stood for. The fashionable Hegelian philosophers of the 19th century regarded Jews and Judaism as anachronistic. The leaders of the poor and the oppressed saw them as classic members of the bourgeoisie. After all, the Rothschilds, the symbol of international finance capital, were Jews. Jews seemed to have benefited so much from the development of the world economy that it was widely believed that they were instinctively attracted to finance and commerce. One of the radicals who grappled with this question and who was to exert a profound influence on others was Karl Marx buried here in Highgate Cemetery. Marx himself was born a Jew, but was baptized in 1824 at the age of six. His father converted both himself and his family to Christianity, because at a time of anti-Jewish feeling and discrimination in Germany, his career prospects as a Jew seemed very limited. And when Marx wrote his famous article, On the Jewish Question, he did so in the light of the prevailing intensely negative view of the Jews. To Marx, Judaism was synonymous with capitalism. Marx's theories became orthodoxy for the left, and thereafter, Judaism was characterized as a religion of commerce. This bequeathed a legacy of prejudice against the Jews, which went as follows. Jews, as economic parasites and creators of capitalism, would disappear once capitalism had been overthrown by social revolution. Marx, who systematically underestimated the force that nationalism would have in the modern world, never saw the Jews as a nation. In Marxist theory, there was no place for a separate Jewish identity or for independent Jewish politics. Jewish socialists, on the other hand, would later argue that the Jewish masses had special needs and a separate role in the class war, that Jews were a people that wished to preserve their identity while joining the universal struggle for social justice. To this, orthodox socialists responded by denouncing these Jews as mere nationalists. 
If nationalism was a crime, then it was doubly true of Jewish nationalism, which was linked to that opiate of the people, religion. Jewish socialists would always be torn between these two poles. They could either be socialists dedicated to the struggle of the whole proletariat, or they could believe that the Jews were a specific group, doubly oppressed, as Jews and as workers. Moses Hess was perhaps the first true Jewish socialist. He faced the kind of personal anguish and ideological trauma that was to characterize the whole development of Jewish socialism. An early pioneer of German socialism and an important influence on Karl Marx, Hess saw himself first and foremost as a radical German. But he did not altogether shake off his consciousness of being Jewish. Noting anti-Semitic caricatures like this one, he wrote in a chillingly prophetic statement, the Germans hate the religion of the Jews less than they hate their race. They hate the peculiar faith of the Jews less than their peculiar noses. Inspired by the national rebirth of Italy, Hess ultimately believed that the Jews too could recreate their glorious national past in Palestine, their ancestral home. Hess's vision was not simply a defiant response to anti-Semitism. He was inspired by the doctrines of social justice in Jewish tradition, by the stirring prophetic writings of Isaiah. To Hess, the struggle to liberate oppressed peoples was as important as the class struggle. The refounding of the Jews' own state was part of the universal struggle for the liberation of mankind. Internationalism, he believed, and this is where he differs sharply from Marx, was not incompatible with nationalism and a Jewish state would offer salvation to the oppressed Jews of Eastern Europe and the Orient, who would form the backbone of a socialist society in Palestine. Hess ultimately tried to reinterpret the Bible and Talmud in modern socialist terms. He contended that the code of Jewish civil law, and particularly the rules relating to the Sabbath, were early forms of socialism. He even quotes from Jewish sources like the Ethics of the Fathers to argue that Jewish morality has always opposed materialism, capitalism, and the selfish pursuit of individual possessions. Hess published his ideas in Rome and Jerusalem in 1862. They fell on deaf ears. The Jews of Western Europe were little attracted by the message of socialism and nationalism. They were too deeply committed to political liberalism and to social integration. As for the still traditional Jewish masses of Russia and Poland, they would discover Hess decades later. Hess's ideas were too far ahead of his time. By the 1880s, however, social and political conditions in Russia were ripening for the acceptance and growth of socialism. In March 1881, a revolutionary group succeeded in assassinating Tsar Alexander II. One Jew, a young woman called Hessia Helfman, was implicated in the plot, and certain government circles leapt at the chance to blame the Jews as a whole for this revolutionary ferment. Peasants who owed money to Jewish creditors, small businessmen in competition with Jewish traders, all these needed little excuse to attack those they claimed were exploiting them. The Jews, it was said, not content with killing Christ, had now killed the Tsar, the Russian government encouraged hatred of the Jews in order to draw attention away from their own repressive regime and the gross injustices of Russian society. With the apparent connivance of the police and the army, pogroms swept southern Russia and even rocked the civilized streets and boulevards of Warsaw. Jews who had once pinned their hopes on the steady liberalization of Russia were shocked by the initial indifference of educated people. Some Russian revolutionaries even condoned the murder and pillage. They said it was a regrettable but useful rehearsal for a popular uprising. Those Jews who had chosen the path of revolution felt betrayed by their own comrades. Thousands responded in terror, flocking to the borders to escape the country that had turned so savagely against them. The traditional leaders of Russian Jewry had no answers to give their people except to sit tight it was left to the intelligentsia and the young to seize the initiative. 
As the smoke of the pogroms cleared, new Jewish responses began to be seen, defiant responses which were destined to have enormous consequences for the course of Jewish history. The principal Jewish reactions were firstly mass emigration to the West, which brought about the establishment of many new Jewish communities. Secondly, involvement in socialist movements, national and international. And thirdly, the development of Jewish nationalism, which laid the foundations for the Zionist movement. Jewish socialists went abroad in their thousands. They took their radical beliefs to the cities of England and America, creating working class communities in which Jewish socialists could organize and agitate. Between 1881 and 1914, nearly two and a half million Jews left Russia, one of the largest group migrations in recorded history. Of this number, some two million went to the United States, while further large groups, each of over 100,000, went to Canada, Argentina, and England. 43,000 migrated to South Africa, 70,000 to Palestine. But well over half of the Jewish population remained in Russia, and their situation continued to deteriorate. A combination of legal and economic pressures forced the Jews out of the countryside and into the overcrowded cities. They were crammed into a narrow range of occupations, tailoring, shoemaking, metalworking, there was cutthroat competition. Non-Jewish employers were reluctant to hire workers who were literate, who tended to be well informed on the struggle between capital and labor, and who demanded rest on the Sabbath. As a result, almost the entire Jewish labor force was channeled not into factories where they could organize, but into small workshops where they were easily exploited. After the shock of the pogroms, the Jewish revolutionaries who did not emigrate at first took the roles of propagandists and educators. They aimed to introduce to the Jews some of the strategies of the general socialist movement in Russia. They had little faith that the Jewish masses would be saved either by the Jewish bourgeoisie or by the Russian revolutionary movement. Only the Jewish workers themselves could protect their livelihood and their communities. But for this, they needed to be organized. The scattered groups of Jewish socialists were united in 1897 into the General Jewish Labor Union in Russia and Poland, popularly known as the Bund. It was in this house in Vilna that the Bund was founded. Bundist leaders also played a major part a year later in the formation of the Russian Social Democratic Party, the main vehicle for the Marxist revolutionary struggle in Russia. It was the original aim of the Bund to be incorporated into the Russian Social Democratic Party and not to remain independent and isolated. The Bund was active throughout the Jewish working population, organizing Jewish labor, providing educational facilities for the workers, publishing and smuggling socialist propaganda written in Yiddish, Polish and Russian into the Jewish pale. It also led their strikes for decent pay and working conditions. Under the Bund's leadership, between 1897 and 1904, there were over 2,700 strikes by Jewish workers in the Pale. This was a huge achievement in the repressive Tsarist police state, but the gains were usually short-lived. Far more successful was the Bund's educational and cultural work, enlisting writers, poets and dramatists to create a golden age of Yiddish literature. But the overwhelming reality of Russian Jewish life in this period was the need for the kind of salvation that could only be found outside of Russia. The vast majority of emigrants went to the United States. Most of them went no further than the Lower East Side of New York City, a district overflowing with hardship, crime and prostitution. Another significant place of arrival for the Russian immigrants was England. Between 1880 and 1905, about 100,000 arrived, the majority settling in the overcrowded, yet vibrantly alive East End of London, until the Aliens Act slowed immigration to a trickle. Jewish immigrants found jobs in small workshop production, like tailoring and shoemaking, familiar from the old country. Frequently, Jewish employers drove their workers relentlessly this kind of work lent itself to exploitation. There was intense competition between dozens of workshops, the work was seasonal, and the continual arrival of new immigrants 